Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, I can't um, see the comments while I'm uh, talking. So um, you may want to come off your audio and just ask me any questions because I can't keep flicking in and out of the comments and then and then the screen. So your introduction, um, this is Qualify uh, Level 7 Diploma in Business and Strategy. And this particular module is strategic direction. So there's a lot of industry discussion about um, strategic direction. There's a lot of strategy mentioned all over the world at the minute. Um, and we're going to try and break that down into how it can actually be used within your organization. Now, I don't have your background in your organization. So um, stop, usually when I'm lecturing, I'm able to relate it to your industries. So as again, feel free to ask me um, anything that you would like to ask me at the end or on the break. So just a wee bit about me. Um, my name's Kira Boyce. Uh, I've been lecturing since 2013. I've lived uh, in Ireland. I've lived in Qatar. I've lived in England, back to Qatar, and now I'm back in Belfast. If you want to link with me on LinkedIn, please feel free to do so. Um, and if you have any questions after this lecture or maybe when you're doing your assignment, you're more than welcome to ask me questions. So this award and body is very highly uh, recommended and recognized across the world. I, am, I deliver on this and two other professional qualifications uh, through different institutes. Um, here's your introduction. So if you've, I'm not sure if you received the assignment brief, I would assume you have. If you don't and you want me to put a copy in the chat, I will. So your introduction here is um, that you should uh, look into these different areas of the information which can be found on the Qualify website, okay? So your centre specification will be given to you by somebody from the Institute. There's a, a link there to the qualification that you've signed up for. There's the quality assurance standards that are there and the policy statement, which is also on the website. If you need any more information on that, or you would like the link in the chat, please message me and I will do that for you. So we'll start with not, not, not the most positive, plagiarism and collusion. So we come across as lecturers all over, um, plagiarism and collusion. Sometimes this is, um, accidental and sometimes it's not but they are very cl clear on the instructions here so in submitting the assignment the learner must complete a statement of authenticity confirming that the work submitted for all the tasks is theirs and the statement should include the word count your accredited study center will will direct you to the appropriate software that checks the level of similarity um, most institutes I work for use Turnitin at postgraduate level. Plagiarism and collusion are treated very seriously and plagiarism involves presenting work, excerpts, ideas and passages of uh, an author, another author without appropriate reference or attribution. So I just want to stop there. Um, often uh, it can be that you've copied and pasted a quote or you have used a theory, or you have used an author's diagram, you need to ensure that those are referenced correctly. So if it is from the Chartered Management Institute, or it is the Harvard Business Review, make sure that's included. That is, that is the most common mistake learners make when discussing plagiarism. Um, also copy and paste and off websites. Um, you need to make sure that you reference it correctly. Collusion uh, occurs when two or more learners submit work, which is so alike in ideas and content and wording or structure that the similarities go beyond what is mere consequence. So since I've been teaching online for the last two years, we haven't had so much of that because it's not a classroom, 
had one or two incidents and, and they are taken very seriously and disciplinary um, is actioned if required. So please also familiarize yourself with the qualified malpractice um, and mal administration policy uh, where you can find further information. If you're unsure about something, please ask me. So a referencing guide, a professional approach to work is expected from all learners and learners must therefore identify and acknowledge all sources, methodologies and applications used. The learner must use the appropriate referencing system to achieve this and marks are not awarded for the use of English. However, the learner must express ideas and clearly and ensure that appropriate terminology is used to convey the accuracy of in meaning. If you want that explained further, please let me know. Qualify as to the two other institutes that I lecture for, recommend the Harvard reference, a style of referencing throughout your work. It's very important at postgraduate level that you get your referencing correct, both within the body of your assignment and also in the um, list or the bibliography at the end. If you add in appendices, you may include appendices to support your work. However, appendices must only contain additional supporting information and must be clearly referenced in your assignment. You may also include tables, graphs and diagrams, Gantt chart and flow charts that support the main report should be incorporated in, into the back of the assignment report that is submitted. Any published secondary information such as annual reports and company literature should be referenced in the main text of the assignment in accordance with the Harvard style of referencing and the referenced at the end of the assignment. So let me just pause there. My best advice is before you start to write your assignment, read the Harvard and style of referencing. I have done a degree, five postgraduates in the last five years and it took me a long time to get the Harvard style of reference and correct so spend a little bit of time reading around that um, and make sure you're familiar with it once you get the formula you will continue to be fine with it so confidentiality where a learner is using organizational information that deals with sensitive material or issues they must seek advice and permission from that organization and where confidential confidential Confidentiality is an issue. Learners are advised to anonymize their assignment report so that they cannot be attributed to that particular organization. The other thing I would say on that is um, I have had personal data included in assignments um, and I've had to reject the assignments because of that. So if you are discussing team members or management, make sure that they are anonymous. The word count policy. So learners must comply with the required word count within a margin of 10%. These rules exclude your index, your headings, tables and images, footnotes, appendices and information contained within references and bibliographies. So it is really the body of your text but they are very strict on the word count. Up until level five, the word count is not penalized, but it is at level seven. When an assignment task requires learner to produce presentation slides with supporting notes, the word count applies to the supporting notes only, but this is not applicable to you. So just to go over that again, you must comply with the word count within the margin of 10%. Okay, these exclude index, headings, tables, images, footnotes, appendices, and information contained within the references and the bibliographies, okay? When you see the word count, if you have not already read the assignment, it can look a little bit daunting initially, but ensure you go back to the tables and images because this will help you uh, within your word count. All work to be submitted as per the due date as per centre's advice and all, must, uh, all work must be submitted in a single electronic document, a doc file or via the Turnitin where applicable. This should go to the tutor, which is not me, 
um, it's your centre manager or the project director, plus one hard copper posted to the centre manager if required. It is not required. Qualify use a standard marking rubric uh, for all assignments, and you can find the details at the end of the document. Unless stated elsewhere, learners must answer all the questions in this document. Okay, so we have the um, mark the marking uh, rubric with all the institutes. Okay, I'm going to pause there and ask. There's a lot of information in those first few slides in terms of assignments. I'm not sure if some of you have done assignments yet or you haven't. Is there any questions? You can put it in the chat box if you wish. Any questions on the assignment or the introduction there? No? Okay, great. Okay. Oh, hold on, I do have one. All good, no problem, Hilton, that's perfect. Okay, so if anybody comes across a question later on, please feel free to ask. Okay, so strategic direction. What a big name in the uh, corporate world at the minute. Um, definitions of strategy. So here's a few definitions of strategy. The determination of the long run goals and objectives of an enterprise and the adoption of courses of action and allocation of resources necessary to carry out carrying out these goals. Competitive strategy is about different being different, it means deliberately choosing a different set of activities to deliver a unique mix of value. A firm theory about how to gain competitive advantages a pattern in a stream of decisions or a long term direction of an organization. So, as I said, strategy is continually discussed at boardroom level, at middle management level, at frontline management level. Um, there's lots of documentation that are written around strategic direction or strategy, but it is a very generic term and there is lots of inter, um, interpretations of it. So bear that in mind when you're thinking about it in your own organization and think um, bear that in mind when you're thinking about your assignment. Really a strategy is you have a goal at the end and what are the steps that you need to get there? So if you want to get up to the top of the stairs, how many steps do you need to get there? And those steps are the objectives within your strategy okay so that's the simplest way i can explain it so strategic decisions are about the long-term direction of an organization which as you know can vary people say that the pandemic is a um unpredictable time i have been a director in management since i was 21 and i have never seen an, a certain time within the business world. It's the scope of an organization's activities. It's gaining advantage over competitors. It's addressing changes in the business environment, which we all now had extreme changes in the business environment. We're now seeing change, what's called change fatigue that is coming out at the start of 2022. Building on resources and competencies, capability values and expectations of stakeholders, and therefore they are likely to be very complex in nature. They are made in situations of uncertainty, affect operational decisions, require an integrated approach that's both inside and outside an organization, and involve considerable change. So a lot of industry at the minute is talking about changing their strategic direction, as a result of a number of different uh, worldwide events. Um, and there is a lot of discussion around change management and understanding change. So what is a strategy for? To define and express the purpose of an organization to its stakeholders. Okay, so again, stakeholders are is a term that a lot of people talk about. I work in the charity section quite a lot, but I also work in the corporate world. And people think that stakeholders are always customers. 
but we have internal and external stakeholders. So stakeholders are those individuals or groups that depend on an organization to fulfill their goals and on whom in turn the organization depends. So I will give you two examples of stakeholders. In the corporate world, your stakeholders may be your shareholders, um, which is normally the first answer I get. Um, stakeholders will include your staff. Stakeholders will include your customers. Stakeholders will include your suppliers. And that's both product and services. Stakeholders may include your parent company or subsidiary company. So that's in the corporate world. And that's a very generic stakeholders. For example, in a public organization, for example, a national health service or a utilities company, you will have the government, you will have any investment, you will have politicians that are separate from the government themselves, you will have your customers, you will have other departments or other institutes or other organizations that work in partnership with you. And then you will have a variation of other stakeholders, such as suppliers, services and products. And they will be on a tender and basis. So they are more involved than they might be in the corporate world. So that's just to give you an idea. Now, we will talk about stakeholder mapping later on, but that's to give you an idea that people often leave out um, the internal stakeholders. So four ways to define an organization's purpose is a mission statement, a vision statement, a statement of corporate values, and a statement of objectives. Now, what I would ask is that as at, at this, the end or tomorrow or the next few days, try and ask or gain a strategic documents for your organization. So you could ask for a mission statement. You could ask for a vision statement. You could ask for a statement of corporate values, a statement of objectives. In different organizations, those can be different. The titles can be different. So it could be a corporate plan. It could be a business plan. It could be a financial plan. It could be all together. Um, some organizations can be, um, they're not public. Um, but you will need this or something like this for your assignment. So um, try and get those from your organization or your organization's website or your head of corporate services. Okay, so strategy statements should have made three main themes. Fundamental goals that the organization seeks, which reflect the statement mission, vision, and objectives. So what is a mission? What do we want to do? How do we want to do it is a vision and the objectives are what do we need to do to get there? So again, if we use the stairs analogy, the mission is to climb the stairs. The vision is to get to the top of the stairs and the objectives are the steps that we need to take to do that. So that's a very simple analogy that I would use in all my leadership and management lecturing. So it gives you a very clear differentiation. There is a number of organizations that use the terminology incorrectly. So just be aware of that. OK, we get it a lot in the UK and Ireland, by the way. The scope or domain of the organization's activities. So often when I sit down with a medium business, medium sized business, for example, they actually don't have a clear idea of what they deliver um, and it's very common because they grow organically and then the particular advantages or capabilities it has to deliver all of these so we're looking at the advantages in terms of the people they employ the technology they have the geographic location that they're in the partner that they have the investment that they have what are the capabilities similar they might have uh, research that they are able to use, their um, 
they create their own software. So somebody else might not have the same software. They have significant government funding or significant private investment. So those are the things that we're looking at in terms of a particular advantage or capability. It has to deliver all of these, okay? Okay, so uh, my little tree has gone. I don't know why that hasn't come up. Oh, no, it's here. Ha! I'm not very good at technology, so you'll have to bear with me. Very good at leadership and management, not so good on the IT. So this is a different levels of strategy. OK, so when people talk about strategy, that's fine if we have 50 employees. If we have 30,000 employees, strategy will mean different things to different people within the organization. So what I mean by that is that a team leader that we would train or lecture to would be at the front line. And their level of strategy may be to ensure that the amount of units that week need to be delivered by Friday. And that is their strategy. I need to have 100,000 units out by Friday. And how do I use the factory floor to make sure that happens? So mission, vision, objectives. However, our corporate level strategy is not going to be that. Our corporate level strategy is going to be a different strategy, a different vision. What are they looking at from a corporate point of view? So it will differentiate between your senior management, your middle management, your frontline management, and your team members. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that we're not, we don't have to be aware of that. But if my job is to ensure that 100,000 units go out on Friday, I genuinely don't have the time or the capacity to be involved at corporate level strategy or middle management strategy. My job is there and that's my goal. That's my mission. That's my vision. I can be aware of the corporate level strategy, but a lot of people aren't. Um, here where I work uh, in the UK and Ireland, it's rare for someone to know what a corporate level strategy is. And that is also the reason I'm telling you to ask for it so that you're able to use it for your assignment. So diversifying from the original uh, organization's original activities into other activities. So Tesla selling batteries for home use. So that's, they're diversifying, they're taking their knowledge, they're taking their research, they're taking their, the people, the skill that they have, the knowledge, the experience, and they're finding another out for it. If we take that down to a smaller level, we could look at um, here in Ireland, um, there was a blind company that used to sell corporate blinds who started to um, make COVID safe um, equipment. So they took again their knowledge, their skill, their factory, um, their uh, people um, and the research they had done and they were able to diversify into a slightly different area um, of industry and make significant profits in that space of time and then move back into their original purpose. So diversifying from the organization's original activities into other activities. Business level strategy. So here we're looking at marketing and product improvement strategies and developing a lower cost volume car for Tesla. So we have our top level product. So for example, my background was in selling land and new houses. Um, and we had to look at the corporate level strategy was luxury houses. However, we, after analyzing the financial plan for three years, it was decided that the luxury houses were still the corporate level strategy. However, we needed to bring in a business level strategy, which made smaller houses for people who were buying for the first time. So we decided to change the plans of some of the houses to a smaller level, a more affordable level. Um, and then we were able to fund our corporate level strategy, which were the back to the luxury houses again. This is very common in Qatar on the Pearl, um, where they had their luxury houses, but they also had apartment buildings, um, which was the business level strategy. And then our functional strategies, which is what I'm talking about in terms of the factory floor. So Tesla's functional strategies are geared to meet its investment needs 
and raising finance. So what's his functional strategies? So this is another, just a little bit of overview. So our corporate level strategies is con concerned with the overall scope of an organization and how value is added to the constitute business units, okay? So I'll just say that again. The corporate level strategy is concerned with the overall scope of an organization and how value is added to the constitute business units. Business level strategy is concerned with the way a business seeks to compete successfully in a particular market. So this is in terms of competition and also it would be making maybe a small or more affordable product, for example. And a functional strategy is concerned with how different parts of the organization deliver the strategy effectively in terms of managing resource, processes and people. So again, our functional strategy is I am frontline manager and I need to get out 100,000 units by Friday. That is how I contribute to the corporate and the business level strategy. But I am at a functional strategy level. OK, before I go on, I'm just because I enjoy strategic direction quite a lot, I can I can talk and talk and talk. Um, and sometimes I've been told that I don't pause for um, so, so any questions. So any questions at this point? No, no questions at this point. OK. OK, so strategic choices. These involve the options for strategy in terms of both the direction in which the strategy might move and the methods by which strategy might be pursued. OK, so what are we looking at here? Everything has a choice. Every person has a choice. Every organization has a choice. Um, we talk about this now in, in, in daily business um, that we need to look at the, the choices that we're going to make. Um, so it might be a choice to change direction and method, um, often and not to reduce risk, they will be one or the other. So strategy and action. Strategy and action is about how strategies are formed and how they are implemented. Okay, so strategy and action is about how strategies are formed and how they are implemented. Now, remember back to the start of the lecture, we were talking about how strategy is often implemented um, in uncertain times, which I'm not sure I've ever seen certain times. Um, and it's also very complex by nature. So a strategy may be formed, but the likelihood it will be changed significantly during its life cycle. And how it's implemented um, needs to be analysed and carefully planned because there are so many external factors that can cause challenges uh, or cause opportunities. So we want to make sure that, you know, it's a simple strategy that is changeable if required and it is implemented and our biggest challenge is communication when we're you we're implementing strategy management communication is the one big the first biggest challenge that an organization will have when they're implementing strategy or they're are they making changes um and it isn't implemented correctly which then causes challenges which then cause costs and resources and often it can have an effect where the strategy or part of the strategy may fail so we need to make sure we look at how they're formed and how they're implemented. The same with your assignment. And I will talk about this later um, when I go over the questions on your assignment is that we want to look how you will form your assignment, the plan that you will make, and then how you will implement that into an assignment. So the emphasis on is the practicalities of managing. So this is down to the managers the people within the organization, the leaders and the managers in terms of how it's formed 
and then they need to be communicated effectively to implement. Now, this is a strategy checklist. These are used continually. Um, I will give them out in many of my lectures and many of my management um, sessions, web, web, uh, webinars, because these are the things that we need to look at, fundamental questions when we're forming a strategy. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this slowly. If you have any questions, I will keep the chat box sort of open to see if there is any questions. So the 16 fundamental questions and strategy. So the strategic position of an organization. What are the macro environmental opportunities and threats? What are we talking about there? We're talking about external, We're talking about macro, not micro. How can the organization manage industry forces? How can we? We need to look at competitor analysis. We need to look at uh, political and economic shifts. We need to look at environmental and legal. We need to look at sociology, technology. What are the things that change within the industries that we have to be aware of and how we need to analyze those things? We'll talk a wee bit more about those later. How are stakeholders aligned to the organizational purpose? Stakeholders in themselves will have a bias. They will want different things. Every group of stakeholders will want different things. So we need to ensure that the organizational purpose aligns with some of those things. So for example, an investor will, may, will have a different opinion on what they want to align themselves with than possibly some of the staff or some of the team. Um, an investor will have different uh, alignment than customers. Um, this, the investors will have a different alignment to the health and safety agency or executive, wherever you are based, because they will have a very different um, view of an organization than, a, than a, an investor will. They are still stakeholders. What is the basic purpose of the organization? So this is where organizations can, especially in a very fast technology world that we live in now, um, can grow quickly without um, structures in place that makes them successful in the long run. And sometimes they lose their basic purpose. Um, we've seen this with multinationals who should stay in telecommunications. They had a growth. They took their eye off the basic purpose of the organization with their skill and their expertise um, lay, and it caused them to become, um, to price themselves out of the market. How does culture fit the strategy? So culture is one thing that we have brought in significantly in business in 2020, 2021, 22. Um, the shift in culture across the world um, can be towards environment. It can be towards recruitment. It can be towards mental health and well-being. We can, there's a significant um, shift in culture because employees are now um, deciding where to work after they lived through the pandemic. We want to look at, is there a hybrid option? Is there a uh, working from home? Is this company environmentally friendly? Are they aware of climate change? Are they aligned with organizations that we don't want them. We don't want to work for somebody aligned with that. So there is a lot of culture discussion around, and this needs to be part of our ch strategy checklist. We can't do a strategy that doesn't fit with the culture of an organization. Once we start that, we will start to fail. So we need to look at the culture of the organization. Um, if we are a factory that is making um, electronic parts, it's not going to have the culture of 
Google in their creative space. It's going to be two different cultures. So we need to make sure that we know what our culture is before we even look at a strat strategy or strategic direction of an organization. So that's our strategic position. Where is the organization? Let's look at where it is right now in the present. Let's go. OK. Strategic choices. How should business units compete? So what of our products can we use to compete? What are um, maybe something that used to compete, but is no longer competing with the market competitors? And why? Why is that? Is that something that we can remedy? Or is it something that we want to change our direction and we want to look at different options? So just because a product was uh, a leader um, and has lost the edge or the lead in the market does not mean that an organization will continue on that trajectory. They might change and decide that products are too expensive in terms of hardware, components, travel, the cost of diesel, the cost of oil, the cost of electricity, all the things that are going up. So they're going to move on to maybe a software trajectory. So this is where we need to look at in terms of what business units and how they compete. Which businesses to include in a portfolio? So if we have a multitude of businesses, then which ones should we include? Is there some now that don't match what we're looking for in industry? Is there businesses that here in the Ireland, we have um, landlines, phones. Um, and when I was changing my provider, 2024, I think, they will be no longer providing landline phones. This was the first time that it directly affected my lifestyle or my childhood, I suppose. So they've decided no, no um, organization here is going to have a landline. They will have VoIP, but they won't VoIP, but they won't have um, landlines anymore. So they just decided that due to the software, due to the lines, due to the hardware, due to the repairs and the upkeep, it's actually not a viable option anymore. And they've discontinued it. Where should the organization compete internationally? So are they looking to compete internationally, hopefully? And where? So we need to look at geographic. We need to look at, again, political, economic, um, social, technology, environmental, legal. So if we are wanting to compete, for example, I'm not sure if any of you would know, but here in Northern Ireland, we're in a very unique situation that we are still in the European single market um, due to the protocol that was negotiated by the uh, UK government and uh, European. Um, and at the minute, businesses in Northern Ireland are able to compete in both the UK markets and the single and the European single market. So there is some checks and balances in place, but at the minute they are minimal. So at the minute, organizations in Northern Ireland are able to compete internationally. Politically, we have two opposing sides. One is for these, the protocol, that's the name of it. One is against. So we are seeing a good economic um, uh, rise here in Northern Ireland because of the protocol. However, they, we may see a decrease when some of those checks are changed. But politics is having a big influence on this and so is the UK government because they don't want the part of the UK still in the single market. So when we're looking at competing internationally, there is so many factors that we need to look at in terms of how we compete internationally. And is it worth it? We've had um, organisations in Ireland who have looked at um, a number of different markets here in terms of exporting. And um, uh, one particular case study that we did recently, they decided on 40% of the qualified places to go. We decided that it was too much money. It was too much investment to do that without a high rate of success. 
So this is one for me. I love innovation. Is the organization innovating appropriately? Are we moving with the times? This is just not necessarily in terms of um, technology, which is an obvious go-to with innovation. It is, are we looking at different ways and processes of managing our staff? Are we looking at developing our staff? Are we looking at better ways to do administration? Are we looking at better ways to do procurement? Are we looking, innovating is always looking at a better way to do something. So um, are we promoting from inside the organization? Are we looking at development plans for staff to move up instead of the, the recruitment and retention crisis that some countries are now facing? Are we looking at that we're using the correct technology or we're looking at the correct software in terms, do we invest in more? Or do we look at alternative ways in terms of innovation? Is our products, is our services innovative? We all ended up moving online in 2020. Been teaching online now for two years. Um, going back into the lecture hall in September. Um, and that was innovation because of out of necessity, but it has now created a higher recruitment of students, definitely here in Ireland and the UK. And I do some work in America and Africa. And we're seeing a, a bigger intake in terms of uh, recruitment of students, development of employees. And we're talking to much more businesses in terms of skilling and helping those business, that, those people to move within the organization rather than recruit from outside. So is our organization innovating appropriately? Should the organization buy another company? ally or go it alone. So this will decide on many, 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 many um, factors. The biggest one will generally be profit or income or funding. So do they have the ability to buy another company? Is the company worth the investment? Is there terms of partnerships? Quite a lot of partnerships are happening now in Europe. Um, uh, and going to the states so we're seeing a lot of partnerships and um, particularly in terms of insurance products and um uh technology around the car insurance industry so that is our strategic some of our strategic choices so if i give you too many fundamental choices we'd be here all day so but these are the things that we need to look at in terms of strategic choices so we've gone through our strategic um, position. We've looked at our strategic choices, like what are the choices that we might have to make? And then we need to look at how the strategy is going to work. We can only um, look at how we think it's going to be. All the external factors could change any of these. But at least if we researched it and we've analysed it, then we can have a good idea of how the strategy will happen in action. Okay, so this is the strategy in action. What would we hope for? Okay, what things would we come across? What factors might change? What factors might not change? Sometimes we look at the things that are moving or they're changing and not the things that aren't changing. We're looking at the competitors that are competing against us but we're not looking at the things that people might spend their money on other than our product. So they might just not spend money, for example. Sometimes that's not taken into consideration. So are strategy suitable, acceptable and feasible? If I had time, I would go into the smart goals and objectives, but I don't. So are the strategies suitable, for example? Is it going to go in and put a software um, systems and processes in place, but we don't have the skills within the team that we have that are able to implement those. So I was working with a company recently who brought a new significant education software into a business, but only one person was fully aware of how the system worked. Um, and that person had COVID and ended up having four months off. So that wasn't a suitable strategy. 
there should have been a team of people there that were trained in the new software and it was implemented. So that wasn't thought through um, in terms of what we talked about in the last slide. Acceptable. So here is um, where your culture might come into play. So your is it acceptable to the organization? If you do not have your people on board in that organization, it will not happen. You can try, but my honest opinion is it won't happen. We have had significant um, strategies in terms of automating jobs here in the UK and Ireland. We have had um, pay reduced. We have had um, the zero hours contract. There is a number of strategies and they are all strategies. So it might be a cost saving strategy, which is not going to be acceptable to the people within your organization if it affects their livelihoods, especially at the minute. So we can sit in a boardroom and we can write strategies all day long, but if they're not suitable and they're not acceptable, they won't, they won't happen. Um, feasible is another area. So if we write a strategy that on the very simplest terms has uh, requires a hundred thousand pounds in terms of investment, but we don't have a hundred thousand pounds. Um, if it is feasible, if we have a significant IT department and we don't have a significant IT department, it's not feasible. If it requires, and this is a big one, change in, change management and leadership training. So this is often left out of organization. We're seeing this more and more where the strategy is good, the business plan is good, the fundamental strategy is good, that every area is in place to implement a good, substantial, well-developed strategy and implement that strategy. But we're seeing a massive skills gap in terms of management. So we see that senior management and uh, middle management in particular do not have the change management skills or the leadership skills or the um, communication skills to implement that. So we have lots of programs happening all over the world in terms of leadership and management, because when we go into an industry, we learn the industry and often you're promoted, but you're not term you're not taught the management and leadership skills that you need to be able to lead a team. And if you can't lead a team, then you can't lead a strategy. So we are seeing now a big skills gap in terms of leadership and management skills, knowledge and experience. So is it feasible? Yes, it would be feasible once we had completed um, significant training with the senior and middle management, which we're in the middle of doing now. So that is the strategies. Are they suitable? Are they acceptable? And are they feasible? Okay. What kind of strategy making process is needed? Okay, so there's loads of different processes, and we are going to talk about these a little um, a little later in uh, the slides. But some people, um, and again, if I had time, we could do this. But we're there are different types of learners. There are different types of personalities. So a strategy making process for for one senior management or one senior management might not be the strategy process that will be able to try, um, to communicate easily to another. Or you might have the senior management team that have a strategy making process that isn't communicated easily to the teams that they need to work with. So for example, it might be a very complicated Gantt chart. And for me, as you now know, IT and Excel spreadsheets are not my thing. So it would take me a long time to process that strategy. And if you don't keep your momentum up, you don't keep your motivation up, you don't keep your communication up, another thing that will help will um, hinder your strategy making. What are the required organization structures and systems? So you will have external stakeholders. One we've already mentioned, health and safety executives. Wherever you are in the world, you will have a health and safety executive or health and safety department. So I'm taking the very basic one there. Um, 
in order to open during COVID. Um, Northern Ireland, um, sorry, the UK and Ireland had uh, COVID specific health and safety inspectors. So if you had a strategy that you wanted to open during COVID um, and you wanted to operate on a reduced capacity, somebody from the um, this HSE would have come out and done an inspection on COVID uh, regulations. So that is a small but significant example in the last two years. Um, we will all have industry regulations, whatever industry that you work in, we will have industry, industry regulations. A very simple one there would be that during your level seven, which is the, organ, uh, the qualification you're doing now, we have to use a plagiarism um, software. So Turnitin is probably the most well-known one that will people will use. So if an organization, for example, an educational institution wanted to provide level seven postgraduate and they didn't have the ability to use the Turnitin software, then they wouldn't have the system in place that they needed to implement the strategy of going beyond degree level. So postgraduate level, they could not go on to provide level seven, level eight qualifications. Significantly in, edu in education, this is um, an area where institutes do not have the systems and structures and processes in place um, to implement a strategy. Um, there is very highly regulated industry as it should be. Um, insurance is another one. And we have lots of new ones that are coming online, which I'm not an expert in, but cybersecurity, for example, we're now holding a significant amount more data on um, personal data than we ever did before. Um, we hold, we are given over so much information on our phones. So there's a lot more online that we will need in terms of keeping data safe and secure. So how should the organization manage necessary change? So here will be what we talked about earlier, which is change management. There's been so much change in industry across the world in the last two years that we are now finding organizations and employee and employees significantly developing change fatigue. So this was first developed in 2012. Or the concept of it was now we're always changing that's not the fatigue it's continuous and intense change that we're now seeing um employees teams and organizations seeing a real slow exhaustion from people because they have been working on a fight or flight basis for the last two years so when we're managing changes Here's where we would go into a lecture around um, emotional intelligence and motivation theories and how we look at our teams and we find out what motivates them as leaders within their organization. And we identify the best way to help them develop and help them get involved with the purpose, help them have autonomy over their tasks, help them have um, effective delegation so they're not overloaded with tasks that really aren't their role. So those are the kind of necessary changes we have to look at within leadership and management. And who should do what in the strategy process? So we all work in organisations that if you thought about a part of a strategy and you thought that person is not going to be the person to implement that part of the strategy because of their personality or the way they view certain tasks. Um, we can look up the, if you want to look up the McGregor X and Y theory of leadership, you want to look up Blanchard and Hersey's leadership, situational leadership theory. Those are two good theories in terms of if we were doing this on leadership, we would be looking at the way people manage and lead other people. So if they have a certain leadership style, then that will be good as long as it's matched with the task. So I will give you an example of that. If you have people within your organization that have an, or, an autocratic leadership style, so this will be some do as I say, 
that is your job, for example. Now, in modern leadership terms, in modern leadership um, lecturing and theories and all the, the forums that I would be involved in, um, you know, that, that concept is generally looked down upon as old fashioned. However, I have a differentiation on that. I um, and many of my colleagues would look at it that you need an autocratic leadership style within certain tasks. So, for example, health and safety is so a fire in the building and you need to get everyone out. You're not going to have a democratic approach. You're not going to have a discussion over who and what and why you should leave the building. You're going to follow the orders. OK, so there will be certain parts of a strategy that will cry an autocratic leadership style, something that everybody might not get on board on. However, that's what's going to. That that is what's going to need to have the outcome, the desired outcomes. And as long as everybody is aware of that and why they're doing it and the end result and that the autocratic leadership style won't be used in the entire strategy, then as long as they're included you will get a much more positive outcome in terms of that. An autocratic leadership style is needed where you need the results in and quickly. So then there will be the democratic areas. That's another low Island leadership style. So who is the more democratic manager or leader within your organization? They might talk at the start in terms of what the strategy might look like. How would it be implemented? Who are the key stakeholders that we need to talk to? Bring the parties in, bring all of them in, health and safety from government representatives, politicians, a uh, sample of customers, sample of uh, people that you buy significant uh, procurement from. You know, who is your biggest suppliers? Who are your, what is your biggest bills within the organization? Those are your stakeholders. Who's providing your electricity? Who's providing your heat? Who's, where are you renting premises from? If you are renting premises, if you're uh, an online company, where do you hold the majority of your data? All of those people are stakeholders. So a more democratic approach may be required at the start of your strategy. And then you might require more of an autocratic approach during the actual implementation of the strategy. So, however, that will differentiate in terms of your leaders within the organization. Um, and hopefully you will have a team to uh, do the strategy process because it will take a team and a good team with key people and key skills and knowledge to be able to implement that strategy. Okay, I'm going to pause now. Um, that's a lot of information in a fairly short space of time. Um, is there any questions on the information so far? Now, you don't have to turn your cameras on or anything. It's totally fine. I just want to give you the opportunity to ask questions about anything that I've discussed so far. OK, so um, if there's no questions, I'm going to take a 10 minute break. So I would ask you to be back online at um, 6.10 GMT time. I'm not sure where you guys are situated at the minute or located. So if you can be back within 10 minutes online, um, we will continue on with the lesson from there. OK, so just to go over the 16 fundamental questions and strategy once again strategic position where are we now what are what are we doing right now what are the micro environmental opportunities and threats how can the organization manage industry forces how are stakeholders aligned to the organizational purpose what is the basic purpose of the organization what does culture fit? Uh, how does culture fit with the strategy? Okay. Strategic choices. If we're going to put into strategic direction, what are the choices that we have? Where are we now? What choices do we have? How should business units compete? Which businesses to include in a portfolio? Where should the organization compete internationally? Is the organization innovating appropriately? 
and should the organization buy another uh, by other companies ally or go it alone so we have looked at where we are what our choices were and then we want to look like what is the strategy in action okay are strategies suitable acceptable and feasible what kind of strategy making process is needed what are the required organization structures and systems how should the organization manage necessary changes and who should do what in the strategy process okay okay so working with the strategy let's look at it that we do have a strategy whether it's a corporate level strategy or a business level strategy or functional level strategy look at what we're looking at working with a strategy okay so all managers are concerned with strategy we might not realize we're doing it we might not um have so the thing with learning leadership and management like you are doing is that we're always doing these things in our organizations i haven't had a student in nearly seven years that isn't doing some part of the theory the lessons that i lecture on they just don't realize they're doing it so when we're learning this stuff it is retrospectively you wouldn't be allowed on a machine in a factory unless you learned how the machine worked but often leaders and management find themselves in these roles without having the skill and knowledge to help them and develop them and improve how they uh, execute their jobs so all managers are concerned with strategy top managers or senior uh, executive their senior management and executive level management frequently formulate and control strategy but may also and should in my opinion involve others in the process middle and lower level managers have to meet strategic objectives and deal with the constraints and all managers have to communicate strategy to their teams and can contribute to the formation of strategy through ideas and feedback okay so in this this can be more of a traditional formula um now we're seeing organizations bringing in uh, middle and lower level managers into the decision making process now this is not always successful but first if we bring in middle and lower level managers we get a better idea of the teams that are going to execute our and implement our strategy um we're going to have a better idea of the challenges that we might face so if I, if i'm in a boardroom and somebody is in it um and i don't have the qualifications or the expertise to understand the challenges that the it department may face with this strategy i need to include them in the bigger discussion okay so we are seeing organizations now starting to involve more key people in strategy development strategy direction and strategy implementation okay so um this way we can analyze the challenges or opportunities that we may not as a senior team or a senior management team have identified organization also may also use strategy specialists so sometimes i would go in as a strategy specialist in innovation um, change management or leadership so many large organizations have in-house strategic planning or analyst roles um strategy consultants can be engaged from management consulting firms so you will see big ones accenture ibm consulting pwc so a few other ones that would be more prevalent in the uk and there is a growing number of specialist strategy consultancy firms uh, mckenzie and co and the boston uh, consultancy group which you can read up on so it depends on what organizations have it's a bit like um in your organization does hr do all the recruitment or do you use a hr organization or an agency do you do you use different types of agencies to recruit different staff do you um look for different skills 
and offerings within those agencies, different prices within those agencies. It's exactly the same with strategy consultants and strategy consulting firms. It depends what type of strategy that you want to implement and how they will do it. Remember, back to the stair analogy. Your mission is to get up the stairs. Your vision is to get to the top of the stairs. And the stairs are your objectives in which you want to go. Whether that stairs is developing um, a research department or it might be to implement now there a lot of people are implementing lean management um, management processes or a new software that might uh, reduce costs across the organization will depend on the management consultants or consultancy firm or use your in-house uh, strategic planning department so very similar to other parts of the organization. Okay, so strategies, three branches. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit in the fundamentals in the terms of questions, but we'll look at it in terms of these. So our context, internal and external. What research would we do here? Micro environmental, industry analysis, cultural analysis and resource-based view. So what are we looking at here? What are the environment around us like? We talked about this earlier. Political, economic, social, technology, environmental, legal, or to name for a few. There also will be within, those will um, overlap obviously with each other. What is our SWOT analysis? What is our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What are our opportunities? What are our threats? So we need to look at a SWOT analysis of our organization. This will help us with the industry analysis. It will help us with the cultural analysis and a resource-based view analysis. So what are we looking at in terms of industry? What are our strengths in our industry? What are our weaknesses in our industry? What are the opportunities that we are presented with or could take advantage of in our industry? And what are the threats within the industry? Okay. Then cultural analysis. So what are the strengths of our culture in our organization? What are the weaknesses? What are we looking at? Are we looking at that we have a high rate of um, staff turnover or low rate of retention? Why is that? Maybe the strategy would be to retain uh, have a higher level of retention. That can be a strategy within itself. Why do we need to look at that? Because then we can be a com better competitor in the industry market and we might be able to tackle the micro environmental factors better. Um, and then our resources would be the team and the staff that we would have. So content, strategic options, choice and performance. So. What are the choices that we would like to make and how could we perform better? Is our performance in our organization up to the challenge of a new strategy? Do we have the level of competencies that we need to? Something that we need to look into. And again, the process. So this is similar to the strategy in action. Formation and implementation. So the strategic planning we need to research. What are we planning? How are we planning it? Where are we planning it? Why are we planning it? Often people go into strategies and forget why they're doing it. They think now that they should be putting strategies in place. And then when maybe the discussion happens initially as a consultant, they actually don't need to put a new strategy in place. They need to just enhance the current strategy that they have. Um, choice and change. So what choices do we have? And is the change possible back to, is it feasible? Um, the other areas that we looked at in terms of that. And then strategy as practice is a continuing strategy. Is it continually striving to put new strategies in place? What is the outcome of the strategy? Do we want a cost reduction? Do we want a enhanced skilled workforce? Do we want to attract recruitment? Do we want to attract um, customers? Do we want to attract investment? Do we want to look for more stakeholders? 
those are the areas that we need to look at in terms of strategy. So I'm just going to cover a, a little summary here before we move on. So although the fundamentals of strategy may be similar, Why did that not work? Okay, although the fundamentals of the strategy may be similar, strategy varies by organizational context. For example, small business, a multinational and a public sector. So we talked about that at the start. It is very different for different organizations in terms of strategies, particularly around stakeholders. Strategic issues can be viewed critically from a variety of perspectives. So hopefully I've covered as many as that. Um, there is so many variable factors within strategy that it can be a, a difficult and challenging process. And it's exemplified by the four strategy lenses of design, experience, variety, and discourse. So those are the things that we should be looking at the strategic direction around the design of it, what experience do we have? What experience could we bring in? The variety, what type of strategy and the actual implementation of it, okay? So, strategic position. We're gonna look at how to analyze an organization's position, determinants of strategic capability, resources, competencies, and linkage between them. We're gonna look at how to understand an organization's purposes. We're going to understand different industry types and how industry develop, uh, develop and change in industry life cycles and how to make five force analysis dynamic through comparative industry structure analysis. So that's a lot to take in there, but effectively I'll break it down. OK, so how to analyze an organization's position. Well, we've already talked about that. What is the external factors? Where are we in terms of, hold on, I've just got one. Oh, <laughs> um, how to analyze the organization's position. Determinants of um, strategic capability. Okay, so let's break that down. Let's take it out of all the industry chat. Where are we now? As an, in, as, as an organization, where are we now? What are the external factors? Where do we sit within the industry? What are the strengths and weaknesses of the organization? Okay, so that's the first half. That's this half. Okay, so we put all these big words in if we want, but realistically, we've already broken all this down. Determinants of strategic capability. What does that mean? It means what are we capable of? That's all it means. Strategy is just throwing in there as an extra. Okay, so what resources do we have? What competencies to have? And what are the linkages between them? So what, what we mean by that is the resources of the organization may be that we have lots of money to spend, we've lots of profit, but actually we don't have people trained in leadership. We don't have a specialist IT. We don't have a forensic financial team. Those are things that are competencies. OK, so what are we looking at there? Do we have the competencies, but we don't have the investment? Where should the strategy be? The strategy should be bringing in resources. So, for example, at the minute, I'm working with two large charities and they have a lot of competencies. They have very good services, excellent products, brilliant expertise in terms of well, one is uh, children who are affected by suicide. And the other one is um, a charity affected by abuse. OK, but they don't have the resources to deliver the, the products and services that they want to. So we are going to concentrate within their strategy on the resources that they need. How do we increase their uh, profit? How do we increase their funding? What political parties are looking for a headline? What corporates are looking for a headline? That's what we're going to look at. OK. So how to understand an organization's purpose back to the very basic. What do we do? What does the organization do? OK, so we want to look at the organization's purposes, understand different uh, industry types and how the industries develop and change in industry life cycles. OK, so understanding different um, industry types. You already know that. 
well, people already know you've already, I would imagine, worked in lots of different industries. So um, an IT company will be similar to another IT company in terms of their structure and their model, because they will organically grow that way. Now, they will differ, but they will differ significantly from a management, uh, sorry, from a manufacturing company or organization. So we need to look at the different industry types. What will be an external force, um, like cybersecurity, for example, will have significant external factors on um, a software company or an IT company. However, if your factory sells hardware um, and it's uh, on a production line basis, I worked with a company recently who made cardboard boxes. They have a, a very small amount of IT and software in their factory. So the threat of um, cybersecurity wouldn't have the same effect on them as they would in the other organization. So we need to look at the different industry types and then how the industries develop and change in industry life cycles. We have seen industry life cycles in our lifetime. We have seen cars change. We have seen insurance products change. We have seen financial products change. Technology and IT are the obvious ones, but we need to look at the other ones that have changed significantly. Food has changed significantly. 30 years ago, it would be very difficult to find vegan or vegetarian food products. Now we have a significant amount um, of choice within, in, within the food industry. Um, so those are the type of life cycles. Everything in business has a life cycle. Uh, team formation has a life cycle. Communication has a cycle. That's how the world works. And that's how industry works. And then we will look at how to make five force analysis dynamic through comparative industry structure analysis. All that means is we're going to look at five ways and how we compare the structure of an organization. That's all that means. But we want to make sure that we're using the right terminology for postgraduate level seven. And I want you to be able to write in an academic style, which you are um, not diluting your assignment because your knowledge will be there. Your experience from the job will be there. And one area some of my students would find challenging is writing it in that certain way and make it an academic a standard um, of language so but I want you to break it down so we you understand what we're talking about here okay so then we want to analyze strategic competitor position in terms of strategic groups market segments and strategy canvas okay so all that means again is we've already analyzed, we've done a lot of analyzing of strategies in the first part of the uh, lecture. And then this is the competitor position. So we're doing exactly the same thing. We're look looking at our strategy. We're looking at their position. We're asking the questions about them. What are their micro environmental factors that will affect them? What is their basic um, purpose of an organization? We also have to look at not obvious competitors, but if someone um, doesn't buy the product or decides in investment in something else, we also have to look at those alternatives. So it's not always a, a direct competitor. It can be an alternative service, product, investment, charity, whatever. In strategic groups, so what are the groups? So the direct competitors, the non-direct competitors, um, the variable um, services. So I might decide to buy a car, I might decide to buy a diesel car, I might decide to buy an electric car, or I might decide to buy a bike. And those are the different types. So that's breaking down very simply, but that gives you a good idea in terms of strategic groups. Okay, what are our options as a consumer, for example? Market segments, we want to look at who buys, why we want to look at, um, is it business to business? We want to look at, is it business to customer? Is it public sector? Some of you may work in organizations that have one government sector tender, um, but within those there'll be different market segments, be different people using your services. There'll be different people using your uh, products. 
and then the strategy canvas is high you know if you looked at it in terms of just a big white page and a pen in the old-fashioned days that's how we did strategy okay so again we just want to break this down into much simpler terms but this is the terminology that people will use at level seven and if you continue on to level eight okay so the layers of the business environment okay so i'm just going to go on to this because we have talked about this significantly but the macro environment okay so the external factors that are around us again back to political we're having it here in terms of the european union and uk leaving the european union we're having it in terms of uh, countries that want to join nato there is uh, the pandemic the the post pandemic um great resignation people are calling it we have people reevaluating their values we have people changing in terms of the type of companies that they want to work for people don't want a 40 hour week or a 60 hour week um significantly here in the uk um the food industry um so uh, sorry not the food industry the um hospitality industry are having a significant issue in terms of recruitment um and i've talked to a couple of different business leaders here and talked to them about you know they've they've looked at what they want out of life and they've changed their priorities so we're seeing an awful lot of change here in terms of the micro environment um and that's not even climate change it is not um that the world can now trade with each other via cryptocurrencies and all these other things you know there's so many factors going on in the micro environment the industry or sector so for example we're saying here that diesel cars are going to be discontinued uh, in the uk i think it's in europe as well um we're seeing constant change in the mobile phone industry um and software um, we are seeing so many changes around the industry or the sectors that we may work in. For me, I work within the consultancy and the lecturing. Um, I'm seeing a huge increase in learners. I'm seeing a huge increase in uh, leadership and management uh, students. Um, I'm seeing organizations starting to invest more to retain uh employees so in the education side of my job i'm seeing a, a, a big change in that in that industry in that sector i'm seeing business now um aligning their strategy and their organizational purpose with the types of development that they are implementing around their employees um and then the competitors so what are we looking at what are the competitors who are the competitors what are the markets we're working within so, for example, um, online courses that are with no tutors would be a direct competitor to the further education college that I would deliver for in Northern Ireland. So that would be a, a direct competitor. There's differentiations. People, some people in my classes wouldn't consider a course without a tutor. They like the constant support and help. Um, and then other people like me. I'm quite happy with self-directed study. So it depends on the person. It depends on price. It depends on availability. There's a whole range of things we need to discuss there. And then the organization itself. That's when we go internal. That's when we go to SWOT analysis. That's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So here's the PESTEL framework. So I've talked about this in slightly different ways uh, in the first half of the, the lecture. Um, and now I want to go through it here. Okay. So the PESTEL framework is a fantastic tool for strategy. This is terms of micro, we can do it macro and micro environmental. Okay. It works slightly better, in my opinion, in the micro. Um, sorry, in the macro, uh, it, it's external factors that are. Um, cause challenges or limitations or opportunities for organizations. So we talked about it before, political. What are the political factors that may implement your organization? This can be as small as a change in a tax. This can be as small as a law um, from importation of a certain piece of equipment that your organization uses. 
this can be um, a change in the health and safety law within your either geographic location or locations. Um, so these are things that politics in general can have an effect on. Um, and big industry obviously have much more of a uh, presence in the political world in terms of what changes would be made. But I am seeing a significant amount of changes due to the, the European Union leaving, or the UK leaving the European Union in literally beside my house uh, where the, the ports are and the political decisions that are affecting businesses and organisations at the smallest of levels. Economic, again, tax will be, will be um, crossed with political and legal. So, you know, if there's a change in corporation tax, so for example, in Northern Ireland, there is a um, potentially proposed change in corporation tax to lower the corporation tax here to encourage organisations to um, export from Northern Ireland or create uh, subsidiaries here. Um, that will have a political impact. It will have a legal impact and it may have a social impact because um, we may see more young people stay in Northern Ireland because of the bigger businesses coming here. So that might be an economic one. Another one would be the rate of inflation that we're seeing that probably at a in UK, we're thinking at a four year high, five year high, something like that. So, you know, that will have a significant impact on, if not the organization directly, it might have an impact on our employees. So here, for example, uh, our electricity has increased, I think it will increase by the end of July by 50%. Now that's not going to affect my organization, but it will in fact affect the uh, uh, employees, which in turn could affect motivation, which could in turn affect my productivity of the organization. So there is a knock on effect there of things that we need to be aware of. Social, what people are now wanting hybrid working or they want the choice of. Um, people want to eat healthier. People want to uh, cycle or use um, public transport to get to work. They want to um, have more soft skills and um, emotional intelligence in their leaders. Um, so we're seeing a, a big increase in training around emotional intelligence theories. Um, if you want to read around emotional intelligence theory, Daniel Goldman is, is the, the main one that we would teach on there. So that's in terms of social, people are changing, they're always changing socially, but we have seen a significant shift um, post pandemic. Technology, technology is changing all the time. Um, phones, software, stuff that I, I have no knowledge of the IT industry and I'm, I'm not going to pretend I do, but there is, you know, I will hear it from students because I learn as much from students as hopefully they do from me. They will tell me about the changes in their industries and the smallest of change, maybe in terms of illegal, maybe in terms of politics, maybe in terms of cost, which would be an economic factor, will have a significant impact on their organisation. So we want to look at those as well. Um, We've got environmental or ecological, they call it sometimes now, um, where we're seeing a significant change in climate change. We're seeing um, people who want to work now for more um, ecological friendly organisations. We're seeing that there's a, a shift in terms of aligning with values of an organisation, which aligning culture of an organisation. We're seeing a lot more people that are changing uh, their motivation for their salary to other motivations. So, and that could be around their environment and then the legal. So it could be as simple as a change in the human resources or your recruitment laws, wherever you're based. So there's a, a, a very small but significant legal um, uh, factor. In the UK leaving the European Union, we are seeing a change in some of the very basic laws that we would have had here in terms of employees, for example, um, where maternity leave now is alternative, for example. So 
course, there's many factors around the PESTEL framework, and this is a fantastic tool. And I would urge you to use this in your assignment as well. Um, and there's plenty on the internet about the PESTEL frameworks. Just remember, if you're using it from someone else, please be sure to reference it uh, correctly so you avoid plagiarism. PESTEL helps to provide a list of potentially important issues, influence strategy. It is important to assess the impact of each factor. Okay, so it sounds a lot. I have talked a lot around that. But remember, these are all things you know. These are all things that you will be aware of. And if you're not aware of them with technology now, you can be aware of them very quickly. Or someone in your organization can be aware of them. You, I wouldn't have the knowledge of technology uh, and how it would affect an organization. So I have no query with going and talking to the person in that department and asking them to explain it to me. Um, and then I will have as much knowledge as I can to implement the strategy. Okay, so here are the key drivers for, for change. So change, the reason we're going over change is because change will, cha will change strategic direction or it will um, enhance strategic direction or it may limit strategic direction, um, but change often uh, either the strategic direction causes change or the change causes a, uh, a, an alternative route for uh, strategic direction. Okay, so the key drivers for change are environmental factors that are likely to have a high impact on in industries and sectors, an impact on success or failures of strategies within them. Typically, key drivers vary by industry or market. So, for example, retailers are concerned with social changes and customer behaviour have driven a move to out of town shopping. Personal disposable income also drives demand for retailers. So that's just very basic, but there's plenty of changes here, but they generally will be environmental. Um, so they will be um, the cost of utilities, energy. It will be... Um, people who, as I said in the last slide, they want to um, look at working for um, a, an organization that has more alignment for their uh, own values. Um, we have seen a, a great shift actually from the private sector into the charitable sector here in Northern Ireland, where, or in, in the UK and Ireland, uh, where you know, they want to use their corporate skills, I suppose, to feel a more of a sense of purpose within an organization that they feel is making a social change um, uh, and helping society. So we've seen a significant a shift in that as well. So these are all drivers for change. Okay, so there is a little bit of um, scenario um, at the top of your assignment. If some of you have read it, you will have seen it already. Um, you can use a scenario or you can use the organization that you work within. So I just wanted to add this in just as an, a little sort of support for your assignment. Um, identify the most re relative scope of study. So the relevant market, product market and, and time span. So you might look at something that your organization's done in the past, but as particular relevance to what you're going to write about. Identify your key drivers of change. So the easiest way to do an assignment or look at a strategy is to look to our past because they, um, our own organization, another organization, because that is your evidence for the majority of the strategy. So what were the key drivers for change? What were the pestle factors which we have the most impact in the future, um, but which we have uncertain outcomes and mutually independent. So if we looked to a case study within our organization, and it can be small, um, you know, it can be as small as changing the person that, uh, sorry, changing the organization that deliver the facilities, um, you know, it, within, so cleaning, maintenance, that can be the smallest. And that is something that somebody wrote on recently, which they changed the tender for the person or the, the company that did the facilities management within their organization. 
And then for each key driver, set opposing outcomes where it leads to very different consequences. So there we could look at if we had the resources to put in the um, strategy and we thought we had the competencies within our senior leadership or our management teams and we realized we didn't, what would be the what would be the outcome there? You know, what would be, um, I suppose I can be a little bit of a cynic. So um, I look at worst case scenario and work back. Um, so generally when we're looking at strategies, I think of everything that can go wrong and then I work back on those steps. So I probably get to the top of the stairs, walk back down them and then walk back up them again. But we need to look at the opposing outcomes. We want to look at the things that could go wrong because that will arm us with the knowledge and education that we need to move forward. So I am going to end on this because I'm going to start on this on my next lecture. So our five competitive forces here are Porter's five forces framework. OK, this is uh, it helps identify the attractiveness of an industry in terms of five competitive forces. Why are we looking at this? Because this will help with your strategic direction. If we understand a very well versed Porter's five forces framework, you will see it probably in marketing as well. Um, but this is in terms of who, what are our five competitive forces, and this will help us set our strategic direction. So the threat of entry, who's going to enter our industry? Why are they going to? What strengths do they have that we don't have? What strengths do they have that we do have? What weaknesses do they have that maybe we have the weakness or we don't? What opportunities are they providing for us? It's not always a negative. What threats are they opposing for us? What opportunities are we providing for them? Why are we why are we providing those opportunities? What do we need to do to change that? Okay. The threat of substitutes. So again, it's not that somebody is going to buy uh, instead of a Volvo, they're going to buy a Renault, a Renault. Um, it would be that they're going to buy a bike. So we need to look at the threat of substitutes. So what is our not our direct competitors? What is the substitutes that people might do? And this is do nothing, remember. The, the bargaining power of buyers. So we want to look at what are customers, consumers, stakeholders, and how they control the market. What are the forces? Um, more ready income um, you know, has caused a lot of changes in buying habits. The bargaining part of suppliers. So I'm sure we've all felt the extent of the increase in a number of different um, utilities, electricity, oil across the globe at the minute. Um, and now we have a significant, a very obvious bargaining part of suppliers. And the extent of rivalry between competitors. So we can look at are they rivals? Are they working together? Can they work together? Are they rivals in certain areas? Is there a partnership in some of their portfolio that we talked about earlier on in the slides? What are the areas there? Are they terms of rivalry? Is there, an, is there a harsh rivalry or is there more work that can be done to enhance their offering to the industries? Okay, you have listened for nearly two hours, which is significant in my dulcet.